Hello, everyone. Wow, too loud. <laughs> so who am I? I'm Owen O'Malley. I've been working on Hadoop since before it was a separate project. My first patch actually went into Nudge. Um, I was the first committer voted in and, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, I was the tech lead for MapReduce and then for security, and now I'm starting to pick up Hive. So if I say anything too stupid about Hive, please forgive me. <laughs> so I was helping a customer that had a very um, challenging problem. They had a huge amount of business critical data that they needed to process. And w how big was big? They were getting a terabyte per day of new data. Added on to that, they needed to keep all of the historical data. Um, and to make it worse, that data was getting exponentially bigger. Every year, it basically doubles in volume. So they need to plan not only for this year's growth, which is as much as they can handle, but they have to expect it to continue to grow. It's generating a lot of drive reports. And then the really unusual part is that they have a high percentage of updates. 15% of that one terabyte of data is either um, modifications of previous records or even deletions. Um, and that's not just going one day back, it's going all the way back um, to the beginning of time, basically. Oh, by the way, if you have any questions, please ask. The lights are a little bright, so I may have trouble seeing in the back, but, but um, please ask. So what does their data flow really look like? Please excuse my, my graphics, but they have a, um, use, a bunch of users that are working against their front end, which is a standard uh, front end, and they're interacting with, with an Oracle database and storing it. Then once an hour, they use Informatica to pull that, the new data that was put into Oracle and shove that into Hadoop. From Hadoop, they do a lot of processing, a lot of aggregation, um, pull it down into summary tables, and those summary tables are then exported off into Teradata. They have a lot of their data guys who are very happy with Teradata and, and have generate, use that to generate their reports. And they also do data analytics on Hadoop directly. So they're just in the process of doing this trans transition, um, but this is where they expect to get to. So especially because they have used, they've got a lot of analytics cu customers inside their company, they wanted a high level language. They didn't want to write Java as much as I, I'm sad that they didn't want to use the MapReduce APIs that we carefully made for them. Um, they decided to go with Hive. Um, and they've found that Hive does, in fact, lower their, their learning curve substantially. Um, but the challenge is that they have those edits and deletes that they need to deal with. Hive traditionally hasn't dealt well with updates and deletes. Um, actually, it doesn't deal with deletes at all. Um, and that's largely because of the capabilities of HDFS. HDFS was traditionally a write once file system where each file you could write exactly once. And you couldn't go back and modify pieces of it. You couldn't um, make any changes to it once it was written. Since then, we've made it so you can append on to files. But um, even those capabilities have problems when um, you're using them in conjunction with MapReduce. Um, <clears throat> so Hive does actually support updates, um, but, or sorry, not updates. <laughs> they can support adding new records. Um, if you do uh, an update to your table, you can add new records to, to the table, 
or you can overwrite whole partitions. If you overwrite the partitions, then that whole partition gets wiped out and um, replaced with the new data. So that clearly doesn't match what they want, right? They want to be able to write new records, or those new records update the data in the table, or even delete rows out of the table and have those show up automatically when they process the, process the queries with Hive. So I wanted to, to, in order to go further, I need to show you what Hive actually looks like under the hood. It presents this nice abstraction to users that, okay, you've got a table that looks like a SQL table. So in this case, we've got the creation date, a unique identifier, the name of the customer and what they bought. And this table is set up so that we're going to partition on the date. You partition your table so that you um, can do queries over ranges quickly. In this case, most of the queries are run over today, but of course they, ha they want all the historic data so that they can process it. But it needs to be fast to get to today's data. Um, so you can see that at each level that, that you get one directory for the year and then a directory per month, then a directory per day. Now, of course, when you lay out your table, you can choose how you want to partition it. But this is a, a relatively common pattern. And then within each directory, you end up with a number of buckets. And those buckets um, basically correspond to the pieces of the, the MapReduce job that wrote the, the data. Um, and so they're basically um, even divisions of the data for that day. So in this case, you can see that inside of those directories, those part things are files, and they can be whatever format, either text, RC file, sequence file, whatever you need. Does this make sense? So with that in mind, fundamentally what you want to do is um, take advantage of the fact that Hive allows you to define input and output formats for each of your tables. Input and output formats were originally designed as part of MapReduce, and they allowed you to specify how you re read records and how you write records. And Hive has taken those and, take, and uses them to define how you, you read and write your records. That's very convenient because then it gives us a nice place to hook in. We can, so what we're going to do with that capability is that we're going to use each of the base, we're gonna have a file that has the base records and then smaller files that have the updates. Um, and we're going to do that per bucket. That enables you to efficiently read the bucket, but in order to do that join as you're reading it, you need to have all of the files sorted on the same key. So in this case, we're going to require a sort on the primary key. We also need, especially with MapReduce, with its failure semantics, you need to be able to sure, be sure that if you rerun a piece of work that you are sure you're going to get the same results. In database terminology, that's called repeatable read. And to get that capability out of this, we need to be able to tag each of those edit files with a timestamp. Now, it doesn't have to literally be a timestamp, it can just be an increment encounter, but when you start a job, you need to say, okay, we don't want any edits later than this timestamp, so that you're, you get a consistent set, even if you launch that MapReduce, another MapReduce job later that updates it. And finally, because the name node can only support a limited number of files. You don't want to keep creating more and more and more of these. Um, and so eventually you're going to need to compact them down. Now, compaction is, of course, much easier than doing the updates all the time because you'll read the files all together and then write them once, which is much more efficient than writing um, edits continually. So, what does the record reader for these look like? It looks like this, where you've got the, 
the base file that has some records in it. And then you have these update files that have a virtual column called, that's the operation, which can either be update, insert, or delete. And as you're reading through all, file, all the files, because they're all in order by the unique ID, we can stitch them together efficiently. So your reader is really reading all three files, and it, I see, um, and it'll keep, and uh, it'll keep squashing them together, and you'll get the the combined result showing up when you read. So um, you can see that record one ends up with the one that came from update two. Record 25 got deleted, and so did record 30. So what are the limitations of doing this? Um, the first is that um, we have to actually manage compaction. One of the, the pieces that isn't as obvious is that you don't want to do compaction on demand. Because what happens then is that your compaction happens when you're at the busiest part of the day rather than the least busy. So you want to schedule the compactions to happen when your system isn't as busy. You can compact the partitions independently, right? You can compact one partition right now and then the other partition later, um, and so on. The tables have to be sorted, otherwise you'd need to load those edits up into memory and that would run you out of memory very quickly. And you have to use consistent bucketing. That Consistent bucketing means that each of the partitions ha have to have a consistent number of buckets. And that's so that you um, know the shape of the table before you start looking at individual files. Now, while we were doing this, we had some challenges. Um, in particular, Hive has some issues. Um, the first one is that when Hive calls the output format, it's already serialized the record for you. That has some advantages for Hive because that means all of the serializations work with all of the, the output formats. But the disadvantage is that you have to, if you actually need to inspect any of the fields while you're writing them out, in this case the unique ID, you need to deserialize at least that piece of the record it would be really convenient if I would actually give you the option of having the unserialized record. Because otherwise, you, Hive will serialize the record, hand you the bytes, you have to deserialize it and um, take advantage, uh, use those bytes instead. Um, Hive also uses its own um, output format interface, which isn't that big of a deal, but it's something you have to be aware of. Um, it basically adds some additional methods over MapReduce's output format. It also has its own output committer. It has this crazy notion that um, after the job finishes, um, whichever of the outputs from Map0 is the biggest will win. <laughs> um, that gets irritating um, if you aren't expecting it. And um, MapReduce actually at this point, that was added before MapReduce had an output a notion of output committer, but MapReduce has one where it asks the job tracker, hey, am I the first one to finish map zero? Um, should I commit my results and then does the commit? So Hive needs to move over to that. Um, another problem that happened, because we're holding a lot of these files open while we're reading, is that the dynamic partitions in Hive that's where you're writing to a bunch of partitions at the same time based on the data. It will hold all of them open until the job's done and then close them all. That's really not what you'd like. You'd really like it to, to finish up with one partition, close it off, work, start working on the next one, close it off, work on the third one and close it off. Um, RC files, um, which are the offer the best compression in, in Hive because they pull the columns apart. Unfortunately, have no index and no bloom filters, and so it works great if what you're doing is scanning the table, but it doesn't work so well if you want to look to see if a particular key is in that bucket. 
And finally, you end up with these fixed bucketing across partitions. Now, one of the questions that, that always comes up when we talk about this is a lot of this sounds a lot like HBase. Um, so why couldn't we use HBase? The pieces that would have been good if we could have used HBase is HBase handles the compaction for you, and, well, with limitations, you still need to tell it when and, and how. Um, and the files are already indexed with Bloom filters and indexes. Um, the bad is that the pushdown filters were only recently done, which means that if you use Hive and HBase together, if you use, um, oh crap, is it in 09 or is it not even released yet? 09 has the work that um, will cut down how much data you read to just the piece that you need to answer this query instead of everything. Uh, in 0 0.8, if you use Hive and HBase together, it would always read the entire HBase table. Um, HBase only has a single key, and that key is in a total order. So it doesn't handle primary and secondary keys, and it also, if you look at this kind of use case, where the, the top of the key would naturally be the date, that means that one region server has got all of the traffic for today, which is pretty fatal. Um, and finally, it's tuned for real-time access instead of um, batch processing. <laughs> so, I almost should leave this slide out, but uh, we were going along on this project and um, we had a little setback. Um, someone ac accidentally was trying to clean up some stuff and deleted the wrong directory. Now, you'd think this doesn't happen, but trust me, it does. Um, actually, everyone with a large Hadoop cluster that I have know has had this happen at least once, where they delete over 100 terabytes of data. Um, so this does happen. The, actually, the really embarrassing part was that they had a change request for the next day to turn on the trash feature. <laughs> it's like, oh, really? Um, the good was that they shut the name node down quickly. Most people aren't that aware that that would be a good thing. And they preserved that HDFS image and edits file. So we could actually undo that piece of it. The bad part was that they started, uh, well, they didn't have the trash turned on. And they brought the name node back up. Um, so we tried to recover by, um, I could truncate the edits log to get the, the namespace back, but the files were actually deleted on the, the servers. And even EXT and delete couldn't recover more than, um, well, on the XT3 server is 30%, and the XT4 uh, about 1%. So <laughs> don't do that. that so that, that this set them back. So they're still in development. Um, the, they have tested its scalability, and it, it is working. There will no doubt be additional bumps in the road as we go. Um, they're, data, they're testing samples as the data reloads, and they expect the, to complete the end-to-end -end testing in another couple of months. Okay, that's what I've got. Questions? So at first, thanks, Ono Mehdi, for his talk. <laughs> so we just have five minutes time to the next talk, so only short questions, please. Oh, come on, someone's got to have a question. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. So, 